All right. I'm here. I'm here. Yes. Hello, sir. Hello. How are you? I'm well. How are you? Oh, I'm great. Hi, I'm great. Paul. Lorelei, how are you? Good. How yeah. long has it how been you? since you've Probably seen since each other? Probably since the rap party, I would say, right? I, a really long time. Yeah. So, like, legit 1997, 96? Mm -hmm. Oh, no, yeah. probably before that, 95, right? Wow. Well, no, we, yeah. we, I think 96. it was 96, 97 or so, yeah. Okay. Wow, mm -hmm. that's a while. So, uh, first of all, thank you so much for agreeing to do this. Uh, it's super cool. When I emailed you folks, I wasn't sure if I was going to get any response at all. Because I, it's, I feel like it's weird. Like, hey, I'm a drag queen. I want to talk about this game that came out 24 <laughs> years ago that you did. How do you feel about this? <laughs> but uh, you both were super cool about it and just really into it. So uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, how is everyone doing with quarantine? Everyone doing okay? Everyone staying safe and healthy and all that jazz? Yeah, it's... Uh... Oh, yeah. Well, you know... <laughs> ready ready for a, ready for a new normal i think yeah me too oh, yeah. yeah so i started streaming on twitch because of covid i couldn't go to bars i couldn't go to any venues and i was like man i want to do something fun that's horror related that you know my followers can get into as well so we started phantasmagoria one uh it was a hoot it was amazing it was very campy and hokey and we all loved it and then after that, I was going to go to a different game and Gus Clark, who's in the chat, who I had said earlier, Gus Clark is the only one in the whole group that has played Phantasmagoria 2 at release back in the 90s. And he was like, Annie, I really think you should check out Phantasmagoria 2. And I was like, but sequels for games are usually kind of crap. So I don't know. He was like, no, no, no. Trust me, it's right up your alley. And he was 110% right. It's like to the... Nice. to the everything i love everything about this game so i just wanted if you have like oh. 15 or 20 minutes just to, to talk about it and maybe answer some questions from these folks that that'd be awesome yeah yeah for sure all right cool all yeah, right so i have a quick question yes. Lorelai, you weren't you weren't part of were you part of the first one did you write that or were you part um, of it no i wrote the handbook for the first one <laughs> you wrote the what so i i wasn't in I wrote the hint book. I wasn't in on production, but I did write the hint book and I was there for some of the filming, which was really fun. Okay. Yeah. Nice. So when you, before we get into those questions, before um, you actually, when you were doing the first one for filming, did you imagine the second one being a green screen as well? Or did you always have a vision of having sets? Lorelai. Oh, I, I wasn't involved in, in, um, the production of the first one. Oh, I'm sorry. I that so. was all Bird Williams. Oh, I got you. Okay. Um, and by the time we ended up pitching uh, the second one, we we actually decided that mostly sets would be the way to go because we wanted a realistic look to it. Yeah, um, it was way different than I thought it was going to be. I thought it was going to be green screen, and then I see Paul in, the, <laughs> Paul in a room, and I'm like, what's going on? <laughs> this is a real room. All right, so <laughs> Phantasmagoria 2. Do you have the script already written? Do you approach Sierra online or does Sierra online say, hey, you wrote the handbook for the first one. Do you want to be part of the second one? How how did that this come to be? Well, I was I was employed as a game designer by them at that point, and they decided they wanted to do a second Phantasmagoria, but they didn't want a direct sequel because there really wasn't any place to go after that. I right. mean, they could have done another haunted house story, but they you know didn't really want to repeat that. So a number of us came up with ideas, and um, they ended up going with mine because it was uh, the weirdest. It's clearly the best one. <laughs> <laughs> so then, Paul. <laughs> So this was your first acting gig, yeah? You didn't have an acting gig before this? Besides like, theater, you didn't have like a, a film or a TV show you were on? No, I maybe had done a couple of, uh, you know, I was in Seattle. I was maybe two or three years out of graduate school. I went to, you know, Penn State for their theater training program. And so I was very involved in theater. I did have a, uh, um, you know, I did have an agent in Seattle and I and, uh, was doing, you know, short little bit pieces and things like that but i'd never done anything to this degree at all yeah also very, very little film experience yeah 
I'm glad, I'm glad you brought up the fact that you went to Penn State because I did a deep dive on you. And I'm in Pennsylvania now. A few of these guys are in Pennsylvania. And I saw that you went to Penn State. And what I do for my streams is I try to promote like a local brewery, especially now that no one can go out and do stuff. I try to just give some promotion to like local businesses. And yeah. I sought out a Penn State beer that I got just for this stream. Fantastic. That's it. So we're going to be drinking <laughs> that a little bit later. Right. <laughs> so you have your agent. Does your agent say, yo, I got this bonkers script. You need to read it. Or did you come across it yourself and you were like, I'm into this. I want to do this. You know, it was more the first. I, I had actually, um, I had just booked a couple of theater jobs that were going to take me into the summer. And so I got a call from my agent saying that there was an audition for this video game. And I essentially told her that I wasn't available um, because of this job. And then I don't know how it worked out. Either she called me back or something. She said, you know, I don't think you quite understand the scope of this thing. It's a huge, it's a huge <laughs> job. They were going with SAG, you know, they were, they were doing the whole nine yards. They were using SAG contracts. It was a six month, at least, I think it ended up being more than that, but it was a six month contract. And the role that I was reading for was the lead and would have been, I mean, essentially in every scene. Mm -hmm. So financially, that was much more exciting. The fact that it was uh, being, cons you know, I, I, I'm not much of a gamer. Right. So the game aspect didn't, you know, uh, have much of an impact on me. But the fact that they were going to film this, the fact that it was a story um, w was very intriguing. And so I went in and I auditioned. And most of the time you don't get, you know, you don't get the thing. So I yeah. went in thinking I would audition and do my due diligence and I'd still go off and do my, my theater, but things, um, things went quickly. And, and Laurel, you probably remember this better than I do, but my understanding, and I didn't find this out until a little bit later, or maybe I knew this right away, but I think you had someone else lined up. Um, there was an actor in LA that I think that was hired originally. Oh, shade. For some reason or other, you know, finance, you know, maybe contract negotiations or something, that person dropped out. So, th so the casting for the, fan I keep calling it a movie. I'll call it a movie more. Than I, I do the same movie. thing when I talk about it. I always yeah. say movie every time because it seems it's a movie. It, I heard that somebody cut it together as a film. I don't know if that's true or not, but I could see it. Yeah, but um, it happened very quickly. So they, uh, so I went in and because they were, they had lost somebody. They were finding so looking for something very quickly so i went in and within like a day or two i i had the part so they probably heard that you were auditioning and they were like oh well, fuck this i'm not gonna get it and then i'm just gonna drop out oh do you mind if i say swear words because i say swear words like a lot swear i can cut away. it back though you sure okay no problem okay cool i'm and deeply offended <laughs> how how dare i how dare i <laughs> uh so Laura Lee, were you involved <laughs> in any of the casting process? Like, did you sit down or like the soundtrack, the puzzles? How much of the game were you actually sitting there for letting them know, okay, I want it this way, I want it that way? Because I don't believe you were the director, yes. correct? I was not the director. The director was, um, our director was also our art director, Andy Hoyos, who is absolutely wonderful um at what he does great artist um i think he did an awesome job directing yeah. but i was in on the casting i got to go to la do the do the um auditions there and we did some auditions here in seattle and that was just super fun i the closest thing i'd done to anything like that before was uh voice casting for king's quest 7 so it was really really fun yeah, Gus, Gus Clark actually pointed out that you did King's Quest Seven because that's one of his favorite games. He just loves your games. Oh, cool. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, so, all right, so this I, is a... I will say that when I got the script, and I'd never seen anything like this, it was about that thick. It was I, probably yeah. 800 pages. And I, it, was so, it was so new to me because so much of the script was the game aspect. Uh, and, and so you really had to... Yeah dig through to get to the story it wasn't a normal screenplay but once you got into the screenplay part of it it really left off the off the page yeah. i'd imagine it was a huge script because the game itself took me longer than i'd like to admit to actually complete 
we usually do our streams. We started from like eight to ten, and then when we got to Phantasmagoria two, we just got so sucked into it. At ten, we'd be like, "All right, we'll just do this one more thing," and then that would be ten thirty, and that would be eleven. <laughs> so we moved it to seven, and then it went from seven to ten <laughs> to eleven thirty to twelve, and it just. It, it took me, but also I'm, you know, my wig is usually too tight and I can't figure out puzzles. I can't retain any information. So I have, I have these folks just help me out. Be like, did you try, you know, the key to open the door? And I'm like, oh, that's a really novel idea. And it, it works. <laughs> Who would have guessed? All right. So for both of you, 1996, your first day, what was the first scene that you shot? And what was it like? Gosh, do you remember? I do. I think it was you walking up to your bookcase and either taking something off of it or looking at something. I think yeah. you're right. I think we, uh, um, you know, they basically, uh, we're in Seattle. And so there's a city, Bellevue, which is about 10 miles east of here. And they, they rented a, you know, a big warehouse and built all these sets. It was, it was, this was a huge ordeal. I think, unfortunately, Phantasmagoria 2 may have broke the bank for all other live video games because <laughs> it went so over budget and and uh, and so, but it was gorgeous. They they created you know uh, Curtis's apartment, his workspace, and I think there's one other spot that were was built in that that uh, studio. And so I think because they're trying to you know do it in order, so they I think they had me on on for the first couple of weeks by myself in the apartment. Yeah. So it was just all of those going to the bookcase, picking things up, going, picking up blob, going into your room, looking in the, you know, it just was a lot of things that were gonna be what the game player was gonna be looking at or, you know, basically getting a lay of the land. So it was a lot of, if I'm not mistaken, I mean, a lot of the filming was was very, uh, um, you know, was rep repetition. Tedious you know, was, almost. A little and, bit, yeah. And especially moments. with like the costumes, because you have to maintain that continuity, I'm assuming, because you can't <laughs> I, leave. I will never wear a gray t-shirt <laughs> again. And, uh, that... With the sleeves rolled up and oh. everything, ready <laughs> no, for those lucky because, strikes. <laughs> that's, that's hilarious, because I think that was a last second thing. Somebody decided that they wanted that. And, <laughs> and then after a day or two, I'm like, can we just do this? And then the continuity, like, no, no, we can't. So for like six, <laughs> forever, <laughs> have this, this thing up, it drove me crazy. <laughs> do you know this thing that we hate? Well, now you have to do it for the next six months. You're welcome. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> Lorelei, what was your experience the first day? Like, what was the feelings of like watching your script, your, what came from your brain to unreal. see it? It, it, yeah, exactly. It was really cool. It was unreal to see, oh my gosh, here's all the stuff that I thought of and wrote about, and there it is. And, you know, but then, of course, when we started out, it, it was, we did a lot of the very workmanlike shots, because there's lots, you know, Curtis walks this way, Curtis walks that way. <laughs> <laughs> and we did a lot of that. And um, it, it was just, I guess, the first couple of days to me were kind of surreal. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it was surreal for me to play it. And I just am some jumpy drag queen that was like, let's play a video game. <laughs> and it's it's crazy because like, so you had a lot to do with like the soundtrack and the casting and the puzzles and all that. That was also because your your choice of soundtrack is like my 16 um, year old. The soundtrack was done by a guy named. Oh, I think we broke up a little bit. Go ahead. Sorry. Oh. Uh, the soundtrack was done by a guy named Gary Spinrad, who is so good. I absolutely love that soundtrack. It's just wonderful. Um, he was a local musician, and um, I think he just went above and beyond. It was great. Um, yeah, the, the puzzles and uh, the story were pretty much me. <laughs> right. I'm kind of like, back, back then, I mean, game designers are different now. Back then... Um, for a full motion video game, my game designer was a lot more like a screenwriter. So I wrote the main, the way I handled it was I wrote the main story to myself. And then I went and started writing the, um, basically all the side things that can happen, which is why your standard 100 page, which is long, 100 page um, 
movie script ended up being 600 pages because there are so many different ways you can go in it. Yeah, that must have been a real challenge to actually like nail down. It was. <laughs> <laughs> and well, especially tackling, you know, she was tackling, it, it's still kind of amazing what you were able to achieve in 1996 with the the themes that you were you were dealing with you know it was uh, it was way beyond i mean it, it it was you know it had its sense of camp and horror and all that but um but boy there was a lot going on there you know with with yeah. you know a gender identity and 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 you know the, the bdsm and all the stuff that this character you know is being drawn towards it was it was amazing that you you pulled that off yeah, it was just so progressive, like for now, especially like touching on like sexuality, gender identity, like polyamory, like that's something that wasn't talked about back then. And mental health, like none of that was like back then, like we're just getting to it now. Did mm -hmm. you did you face any backlash because of that? A little bit. I we got a. Um a slight nasty gram from the National Institute of Mental Health saying you're stigmatizing people with mental health issues, but they hadn't seen the game at all. Yeah. And I wrote them back an open letter saying, I don't believe that's the case. I myself have mental health issues. People in my family do. Okay. We did, you know, yeah, we played some of it for, 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 you know, the whole thing with the over the top electroshock therapy, Everybody knows that's not how electroshock therapy works. Right. But on the grand scheme of things, no, I don't think that we really were, um, you know, out of bounds on that. That's good. What about you, Paul? I remember in our initial email, um, you had just made it very clear, like, oh, you know, I want it to be respectful for everyone, so we'll have a good time. Have you encountered any, like, situations that were kind of uncomfortable or not so great? No, because I'm not really, again, I'm not really in the world. So I've been, it's only, it's, it's been fascinating, you know, you know, when it first came out, you know, in, in, in my memory of it, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but is that it wasn't very well received. It was, it, it didn't get great reviews. The gamers didn't get enough gaming out of it. Right. And there was, yeah. it was, it was slow. And, and, and so it didn't, it didn't fit something. And so it kind of, didn't have the big splash that that they thought it would <clears throat> and so you know and then i'm basically just trying to keep my career going as an actor yeah and thinking i could maybe <clears throat> excuse me a second you know capitalize on this a little bit but even as i went down to la with this really huge um uh, credit under my belt it, it, there wasn't enough understanding of of games back then mm -hmm. as a crossover so yeah. it didn't really serve me very well in terms of a calling card, you know. Um, but what's been fascinating is like, it's like you said, it's 24 years later and that this has found a life or it's it, the, the life has continued, the cult sort of status of it has been fascinating. So I have been, I've received, you know, a lot of nice comments over the years. And I, and you know, I know that there's been some, you again, I haven't watched it that I know, but I know that there's a YouTuber that did a kind of, um, uh, Mystery Science 3000 kind of, you know, which it totally is absurd. It, it deserves to be, you know, to have be made fun of in a lot of ways, you know, and I think that's totally great. I just want to make sure that uh, that was my fear is that, you know, oh, are, yeah. are, are we, you know, <clears throat> yeah, is, is a, oh, the left players are hilarious. I love that. I, I don't mind the burns at all. It's funny. It's yeah. absolutely <laughs> great. Yeah, and, and well deserved and, and it, it all fits, you know. See, that's what I was expecting. And there have been a couple of people. No, well, go ahead. Go ahead. There have been a couple of people who cut it together as a movie. You can find that on YouTube, which is kind of cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was definitely expecting more campy when I played it because the first one was just, it was very, very campy. So I went into yeah. the second one with a completely different mindset and like, half an hour into it where stuff is oozing out of the phone and there's like a lot of like just biomechanical <laughs> stuff. I was like, oh shit, no, this is real. <laughs> Wait a second, this is the real thing. <laughs> so actually that leads perfectly into what I was gonna ask you. So as far as your inspiration goes, I I myself picked up on like a lot of like Clive Barker, like Geiger from Alien as far as like the art goes. Mm -hmm. um, 
And one of my favorite uh, horror films, Jacob's Ladder, I definitely saw in this, yeah. in this, I almost said film myself, in this game. Do you, were any of those inspirations for you? And if not, what were your inspirations? Absolutely. All those were, um, I'm also a big fan of David Cronenberg. Um, basically, my inspiration was the whole kind of movement that it sort of started with Clutter um, on the page and Cronenberg on the screen, which was both surreal and um, exploring sexuality and sort of, you know, the, the merging of, of sexuality and horror and that kind of a thing. And I thought, wow, you know, can I get away with this in a video game? Because back then, when people thought video games, they thought kids. Right. And that was kind of a big hurdle. <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure. But, I mean, it, it seemed to work out pretty well. Mm -hmm. And I... Yeah, but Paul is right. It wasn't super well received. It's, in my opinion, it's not a great game. Um, I don't think my game designer skills were all that. Uh, I think it's a better story. I mean, the story's fantastic. Um, did you, I don't know if you remember, the very last puzzle? Did you put that puzzle together? Because, man, it was really, really tough. <laughs> <laughs> was that the one in the, in the other world? Yeah, and it was like a, almost like a brain-looking thing, and you had to flick all these devices. And I had someone show me how to do it, and I was still like, I don't know what I'm doing, guys. Like, <laughs> We might not beat this game tonight. <laughs> not me. I'm not a super big fan of you got to hit exactly the right little spot kind of puzzles. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was it it was a challenging one. <laughs> yeah. Nice. I'll, I will say that um, <clears throat> you know there there was a, a huge they they ran out of money. Um, and so by the time we got to the, the other world, they had a you know their their ideas, and and that was going to be the biggest set piece of all. Yeah. And next thing we knew, we we're like we got two more weeks to do this, and so what was going to be another probably month of filming, got oh filmed in a week or so, and it was all green screen, and you could tell mm -hmm. they were scrambling yeah so fast to try to to make up for what yeah. they couldn't do. And I don't know what that the, the puzzle you're talking about, but I imagine <clears throat> their way of trying to make up for what they couldn't do in, in the script was in post, you know, and, and, and creating more intricate game pieces or puzzle pieces or things like that. I was hoping, I was like, man, I hope they're doing this to sell those handbooks and those guidebooks because it would have made me instantly like, I need to buy this right now. <laughs> I can't do this anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I know. Yes, uh, it did. We did run out of money. No, no, go ahead. I would say there was so much more to the alien world, that, and there there was like an entire chase scene and escape scene from um, the mental hospital that we had to cut. There was lots and lots of stuff that ended up on war, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, I had read there was stuff that was like left not in the game did they mm -hmm. add a little bit more to like the backstory of curtis craig or was it just more um substance for leading the story on most of the stuff be well because the alien world stuff really was at the end of the story um most of the story had been told already so it was mostly just really cool stuff that got left out. um you know his story had already pretty much been been told yeah yeah, it was it was fantastic. I loved it. So I know uh, Jason Thomas has a question for one of you folks. So go ahead, Jason Thomas. Can you hear me? Yep. Cool. Yep. So uh, I was kind of blown away. Um, I'm I, I really love film. I love stories. I, I you name it. I I love a good story. I was blown away by the character arc in this story, and I want I was curious whether or not this huge i don't i don't even know how to say what i'm trying to say this was a very likable character which is very hard for the the level of psyche that was going on here um i don't know if that's that's kudos to you lorelei more kudos to paul for the way he the way it came out i wanted to know if this character was more from the pages that way or if it was fine-tuned while you guys were filming i'm gonna say that's paul Yay. He was, he, was, he was absolutely great. 
Well, I'm, I'm curious, Laura, like when you were thinking of, of him writing him, what was your, you know, we, we, I remember, you know, it's been so long and I know that you and I spent mm -hmm. a lot of time talking, but I can't remember all the conversations that we had about where he was coming from. Because as I think Annie said, there wasn't a lot of backstory. We don't know a whole lot about what we do is childhood and that he had a horrible yeah. father and, and things like that, which by the way, like a girl, if you guys didn't know, <laughs> the guy who played the dad, my dad as a child, was the husband of the woman who played Therese. Not so awkward that, at all. That was all. a weird day when I was in the harness. That was a, that was a um, But, uh, you know, I saw someone who was just struggling to keep it together. You know, I felt like he was a he was an inherently yeah. good person who was trying to have a normal life. And, you know, he was clearly having issues keeping it together. And then the biggest issue was this thing that was happening, was he seeing this or was it part of what was going on? And was, and you know, and, and could he, I don't think he could even think until later that he was actually the, you know, he was the problem as much as he was the, the, yeah. the person running away but from it. To no, right. no fault of his own. <laughs> like he's just like a tortured, a tortured soul at the end of it all, you know, like mm -hmm. through no fault of his own, he had to go through all of this. And I think you talked about a movie that you saw, The Jacob's Ladder, and I remember like that too. The other film that really stuck out to me that was a few years prior to that was Angel Heart. If you've never seen that, it's I don't a, think I've seen more. Angel Heart. It's it's a fascinating film. It's Mickey Rourke and Lisa Bonet. And, I'm adding um, it to my list. It's, it's another character who is thinking he's doing one thing, and I don't. I won't ruin it for you. It's an amazing film. It's it's a it's a did you, did, was that in your canon as well, Laura, Laura Lee, when you? Oh, absolutely. It's one of my favorite movies. Absolutely. Yeah. That one, um, we actually, we like the aesthetics of um, the original, obviously. Uh, gosh. The movie about the medical students who keep killing each other. Flatliners? Flatliners? Yes. Yeah. Yes. We like the aesthetics of that as well, because the whole you don't know what's real, what's not real, which life is is the actual one, that kind of thing. Um, we looked at that. There were a couple of other movies we looked at just for aesthetics. Um, uh, clearly, we really like the you know the uh, the whole aesthetic of um, Seven had just kind of come out not that long ago, and yeah, the, you know <clears throat> based on on just that look was so compelling at the time yeah now that now you say old, it i could see it absolutely cool. yeah all right uh gus clark i believe you have a question as well uh one for one for both lorelei and for paul um like like i said i played this game when it came out in 1996 i didn't beat it till i was in my 20s uh, <laughs> But um, you were too young to be playing that game. Oh, I absolutely <laughs> was. I, but let, Somebody, somebody's I mean, parents didn't. Uh... I, <laughs> I, um, I, I, I'm a chronic insomniac. I, I actually did not develop a regular sleeping pattern until I was 35. Uh -huh. So that's what I did at night was I played adventure games. Um, uh -huh. One of the things that um, I didn't become aware of until later was the ESRB hearings uh, that happened. I think just three years they had started before this was released. Did that reshape any of what you guys wanted to do with the game, how the characters were portrayed? I mean, you touch on a lot of very mature subject matter and you do it very maturely, uh, which which I think is something very special about this game. Did any of that come from the ESRB or those hearings? No, we didn't change a darn thing. We just put the ESRB warning on the box pretty much. Um, yeah, that all was, was very new. And at the time, and I think it still is, it was self-regulation. So we put the 17 plus. I figure, I mean, yes, there are very mature themes, but when you look at the whole thing, you're not going to see anything in that game that you're not going to see in an R-rated movie. So we figured, you know, we, we would kind of rate it like that. Um, there were people who didn't agree with us. It was banned in several countries and Sears stores everywhere. <laughs> but... Uh, well, I picked it up at a bookstore. <laughs> we also uh, filmed uh, PG versions of some of the racier stuff too. You know, not that I remember. You know, we, we did. Yeah. So I know that that was uh, you had that in. You guys knew about that going in that there would be some, you know, uh, outlets that weren't gonna. Right. It wasn't gonna fly, right? 
Yeah. yeah, you you could set it. You could set it as um, you, there was actually a setting I think originally where you could set it at PG or R. Like anybody ever is going to set it for PG. And what parent is going to buy this psychosexual <laughs> horror drama? For the kid they put play it on PG. <laughs> That's what I loved about it, though. It's because its default setting was the R setting. You had to put a mm -hmm. password in to get rid of it. <laughs> I loved it. <laughs> it's yeah. not like Mortal Kombat where it was like. Put this code in for blood it was like no put this code in if you shouldn't be playing this game no that's funny <laughs> all right uh, and a few countries did in fact go with the pg version i believe probably um australia australia is really big on censoring their video games i'm sure they were pretty big on it <clears throat> all right i think paul c has a question to ask paul c where you at sure hey bud Hey, I'm here. Can everyone see my face and hear my voice? Yes, yes, we can. Very cool. All right. So uh, I'll start out by saying, you know, like like Annie said, she started these play alongs to uh, kind of bring us together during the shelter in place in, in the absence of the live venues where we usually hang out. And um, this game in particular, uh, with the story and the gameplay and, and, and the whole experience, um, really gave us an outlet for interactive gameplay um in a way that i'm sure your 1996 selves would not even be able to imagine um you know just streaming <laughs> these video games in real time on the internet so i i really appreciate the time sure. and effort that um that you and and the rest of the crew put into this game so my question um doesn't actually relate to the game itself um but to performance art in in a broader sense um i know i've been kind of lamenting uh the cancellations of concerts and art galleries and stuff that I've been looking forward to, um, you know, since last year for, uh, for 2020 and beyond. And I was just wondering if there were any um, performers kind of local to your area or, you know, globally, just local to your heart, um, musicians, um, performer, performance artists, visual artists, et cetera, that uh, you wanted to give a shout out um, for us to look into, to, uh, to support, to kind of broaden our horizons uh, in that regard. Um, gosh, uh, I've been really into Slim Cessna's Auto Club. <laughs> They're a band out of Bellingham. Absolutely delightful, dark Americana, really great stuff. And I've, I've seen them up there a few times, and when everything goes back to normal, definitely check them out. Oh, gosh, I don't know. I mean, I, I think, uh, I mean, I guess what I'll, I'll, I'll take this as an opportunity to, you know, I, I, I do a, a project that is so not it's like the antithesis almost of of, of horror but i it's so a, cool it's so cool <laughs> uh, thanks I, I have a small company here in seattle called letters aloud and what we do is we we um primarily do live performances we travel the country and do um you know performing arts centers and colleges and we'll do high schools but what we do is we read real letters from famous people throughout history uh allowed in front of an audience so we'll find these these letters that have been made available you know online mostly uh or in books or, or such but it's a really wonderful way to sort of bring humanity to history in a very entertaining way and so you just get to know more about time periods and some of the people some of your heroes like there's a great letter that we read in one of our shows from bruce springsteen when he was like 18 or 19 and he was it was a, it was a handwritten letter to his uh, landlady because saying that he couldn't make rent that month so it's like you're you're reading this letter from someone who hasn't hit it yet and he's still struggling to make it happen and so there's just this really wonderful you know voyeuristic peek into the world of 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 so many people throughout history and um so that's been really fun um we're very much missing traveling and 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 performing we have started a uh, youtube channel where right now we're we're just releasing we have a 10 part letter of the week little video um we're on a little bit of a hiatus because times don't quite we want to just be respectful to what's going on in the world right now and some of the letters we have are fairly quirky and fun and i think we might want to give it another week or so before we can get back out there but so that would be something i'd love for you to check out uh it's uh you know and, and you know check out the, the the youtube videos i think we'll get a kick out of those yeah i've i've been sharing it on my page and uh this one user, uh, A. Pascal, she's been with me on Twitch since I started doing it, every single thing I do, and she's really sad that she couldn't be here. But 
she shares that on her page like every day on her own personal Facebook. She's like, no, no, guys, check this out. Check this out. She loves it. Oh, I know G Gus Clark and I uh, were talking earlier about one about uh, the Bears. Was it the Bears? Yeah, no, the Browns. Yeah, oh, yeah. the Browns, the Browns. <laughs> I think one of the best parts about what you do, though, is and I think it's just so smart, is that you don't let them read it prior. So everything they're reading, it's for the first time and they react as if they they normally would if they were getting that letter. It's so well, we found that and we would find that in the live performances if because we would have a big projection behind us. So you could, you know, the letter would be projected behind the actor who's reading it. And we'd have live music and stuff. Um, but we found early on that if we projected the entire letter, the audience would read ahead and they yeah. would end up, you know, getting the, the joke or whatever before the actor got there. So we've had to figure out ways to give you just a little bit or to crop it in a way that will give you something, but we still want the actor to be the one to, uh, uh, so we're trying to do the same thing with the videos a little bit, keep it, you know, keep us honest, you know? Yeah, it's it's super That's cool. And as soon as it starts touring again, uh, I'll be in Philly, wherever you perform, I'll absolutely yeah. be there. I won't All be right. the eight foot drag queen, so you might not recognize me at first, but I will absolutely be there. <laughs> Awesome. Well, we'll let you know for sure. Yeah. Lorelei, are you working on anything right now that you would like to talk about? Um, I, I kind of got obsessed with the idea of making a stop motion film and that's kind of what I've been doing. I've been working on stuff and puppets and things at home because it's something I can do both by myself and, and with my kids and I don't have to go anywhere to do it. Nice. <laughs> so I've been kind of locked in. Yeah, that's, that's but perfect. Um, Alan Conley, did you have any questions that you would like to ask? Because I know he had sent me one, but I'm not sure if we went over it. Paging Alan Conley. If not, that's fine. I have like one or two. I'll let you go. I don't want to hold you folks up. Um, I super appreciate you folks doing this. Like this is, this is amazing for me. I love the game. Um, one of the things I wanted to say <clears throat> is that I wish just like Gus Clark, even though he was a little bit too young to be playing it. I wish I had a game like this when I was a kid to kind of tell me like, hey, you know, it's okay to be a little bit weird. It's okay to be a weirdo. It would have made me growing up like it would have made all of that a lot easier, especially touching like the gender, uh, the gender identity, uh, mental health, all, all the things that we talked about. So it's really just for Paul, for you to take the script and be like, it's 1996, but you know what? Fuck it. I'm going to do it. And this is going to be great. You were amazing with it. And then Laura Lee, just you having the balls to just fucking do it, to write it and be like, nah, this is my work. And the fact that they didn't really change it or you didn't let them change it, however it happened, like it's, I'm just super grateful it happened like that. Well, I'll say that that on set, and, and, and I completely agree, Andy Hoyos was just the greatest leader we could have. Uh, he was so wonderful, just a great person. You know, he was a little out of, we were all out of our depths a little bit, but he was just so, so gentle with everybody. And we had this incredible crew of young USC film grads who did all the, you know, all the camera work and, and they were, they were unbelievable. I'm sure they're all just, you should, if you haven't, you should look up there. I'm sure they have amazing careers right now. I haven't looked, I haven't looked at uh, what they're doing, but I bet. I'm going to put it on my to-do list. Matt, the DP Matt was incredible. Um, but all that said, uh, I just lost my train of thought. Um, Oh, but like to have Laura, they, everybody was on board. No one questioned it. No one ever was, you know, this is a little risque or should we change that? It was just, everybody was fully in the whole time. And I, I personally would like the, 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 the character of Trevor and the friendship between Trevor and, uh, <laughs> and, and Curtis, you know, and the thing that was fascinating to me was that when Curtis in his confusion kind of makes a move on his friend, to have the friend who's the gay character say no what well, you know i had never seen that in a film before it yeah. was usually the gay character was making the moves and and here's a gay character going you're troubled and this is not what you need right now yeah so responsible beautiful, beautiful moment yeah yeah it was great and just like the courage it took him to actually just you know have his feelings out there and just go for it like it was it was great um a pascal who isn't here she was the one if who Yep. yep. If I could change something about the script, I would not kill Trevor. I have come to loathe the let's kill the gay best friend thing. 
I hate that. I mean, it was in there because I wanted, uh, that would be the thing that would devastate Curtis to the point that his mind might break. Mm -hmm. But looking back on it, I wish I hadn't done it. Hmm. Interesting. Have you <laughs> ever considered writing a, like a sequel or like a graphic novel or something to continue? Not so much Curtis. Well, I mean, I guess Curtis's story, it could be continued because depending on which ending you pick, he either stays in the threshold or he goes back and he's he still has these issues. They're not completely addressed yet. Have you ever th thought about his journey and where it would take you? I've thought about it. Um, because I don't own the IP, I haven't really done anything about it, but I suppose I could do a fan thing. <laughs> That'd be awesome. Sure. Yeah. Every, One... every now and then, I get an email from somebody who was a kid when they played this, and sometimes people say to me, it made a big difference to know that there was someone out there saying, it's okay to be different. And honest to God, if I never do anything else in my life, that just makes me so happy. If if I helped anybody at all in any way, that makes me incredibly happy. Yeah, I understand that. Um, actually, in my in my town, I did because I had the same thing. I was watching a TED talk, and the last the last slide was "Be the person you needed when you were a kid." And I was like, "Well, damn, that hit me right in my feels." And I started doing <laughs> drag queen story time, and uh, I did it in the town that I live in, right outside of Philadelphia, and it was met with a lot of. Uh, a lot of resistance but out of that so many more people came and just flooded the streets and to the point where it it's on my wall right over here it's a proclamation from the mayor making that day a holiday inclusion day to be celebrated every that's year awesome. so cool that's wonderful yeah yeah so that's just Lorely, just to you know, touch on what you were saying, I completely understand because I'm like, cool. If some kid, if his life is gonna be a little bit easier, knowing that he'll be okay if he's a little bit weird, just be cool yourself, be cool to everyone else, and you'll be good. That's perfect. Hmm. Yeah. That's well, congratulations. That's fantastic. Oh, thanks. That's All right, amazing. So we're around in 45 minutes. I don't want to keep you any longer. Uh, just one more thing. I'm gonna pull a Jerry Springer and do you know at the end where he like does his whole monologue and he's like, take care of yourself and each other. And it's going to be also, it's going to be a question as well. I've been watching a lot of Jerry Springer lately. It's free on whatever channel I have. <laughs> so, <Nice. laughs> so 1996, right? You guys, you filmed your game. It was different. It was bonkers. It was fucking cool. Something that either one of you probably had never been involved or thought you'd be involved in before. Fast forward 24 years, 2020. We're going through crazy social times right now. First, the uh, the quarantine with COVID-19, no one can leave their house, all of the riots or Black Lives Matter, yeah. everything is just on edge. And everyone's kind of kind of feeling it. Did yeah. you ever think that 24 years later, some person, some drag queen, <laughs> would be streaming your game and bringing together... So this is just like a small group of everyone... There's a much larger group that all watches and plays along and they now know each other like they had they were strangers before they all know each other's names they're friends on facebook they're it's a community now because of something you two did 24 years ago did you ever think that that would happen ever no i had no clue and i think it's amazing and wonderful yeah, I, I was expecting it to happen a lot long ago, a lot longer ago, but I'll take it right now. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> no, it's uh, it's it's amazing. Yeah, I, I wish um, it's it's neat because you know the the response. Uh, you know, I I don't know. I get like I'll, I'll check my very inactive Facebook page occasionally, and I'll see like those chats or the messages that are like in some spam filter. And I mm -hmm. one I think a couple of years ago I didn't. There were hundreds of them in there. Um, and they're all sort of people that were Fantas fans and, um, and they're all over the world, you know, I yeah. get people from Turkey and Spain, and there's a huge thing in Germany. And, and so, um, you know, and I'm, I'm still friends. I, I, I'm friends with the, the gal who played Therese Rachna. I've known her forever and her, she, uh, I see her, you know, regularly, um, her and her husband and their, their kids and. Uh, it's a different husband than, than who she was with at the time. Um, 
so we talk about that. It's, a, it's an amazing experience and it's nice to be able to talk about it again. You know, it's fun to, you know, so maybe, maybe this is the beginning of, maybe we can all go on tour, Lorelai, and uh, we can, uh, we can do. Uh, yeah. I actually, yeah, I actually <laughs> said cool that. Comic cons and things like that. I said that to a follower not too long ago. I was like, if I'm ever a famous drag queen, I'm going to try to make like a Phantasmagoria con or just like an <laughs> FMV con where everyone could just do panels and meet each other and reminisce. It would be fun to see everybody again. I'm sure, you know, there's, cause I've seen, I know Rocket, but there's a number of the actors I haven't seen. I'd love to see Andy. It's been for, I haven't seen him since we stopped, you know, so that'd be kind of fun. I'm going to make it my personal mission to reach out to every single person and make it happen. <laughs> Million dollars. <laughs> I have that. Yeah. Andy, if you ever want to interview him. What was that? I can't hook you up with Andy. If you ever want to interview him, he's yeah. great. I mean, I want to talk to everyone who was a part of this because it's such a, it's such like a magical thing that has mm -hmm. just. We're not talking about the movie that won the Oscar four years ago. We're not talking about. <laughs> you know whatever won the tony in 2006 but we're there are people playing this video game that you folks made 24 years ago it's yeah. you should be very proud because oh. you are just you're both fantastic and amazing and we all appreciate you so much well thank you annie thanks guys really nice to well, meet you well you are too and thanks for making this happen yeah thanks for being a part of it all right so i'm gonna end the meeting uh thank you again uh paul and Lorley. i'm sure we'll be in touch at some point Everyone, stay safe, wash your hands, do all that stuff. <laughs> I'll talk to you folks okay. soon. All right, bye have bye. a good night, everyone. Uh -huh. Bye. Bye.